This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Today's show begins with Thomas Nilsson, faculty member at Olds College of Agriculture and Technology, and Terry Griffin, K-State Cropping Systems economist. The pair discusses challenges technology faces when trying to be adopted by producers in agriculture. Thomas and Terry continue the show with what Thomas has found from his research in Canada about technology adoption in agriculture. Terry provides insight on Canada's similarities to Kansas. Cade State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eyestone, wraps up today's show by discussing some options for killing or at least controlling weeds in the vegetable garden and home landscape. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. As many of you know, technology in agriculture is kind of constantly evolving and seeing being more adapted into the industry. And to talk about that today, we have K-State Cropping Systems economist Terry Griffin and faculty member at Olds College of Agriculture and Technology, Thomas Nilsson. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Shelby. It's great to be here. Thank you, Shelby. And also thank you to Terry. It's been a wonderful visit so far and he's a great host. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thomas, you're not from Kansas State University, and so what has brought you to the university? I'm uh, working for Olds College. Uh, I've been with Olds College of Agriculture and Technology for about three years now. And uh, when I moved there to the college, um, I reinitiated a contact with uh, Terry. Um, Him and I went to grad school at Purdue together. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea to develop a a network of uh, trusted uh, advisors and and mentors and coaches to help me uh, with that career transition. And he's been great with that. I've really enjoyed our uh, relationship that way. We've also uh, had a series of common research interests. Uh, We have engaged in a couple of media interviews over the last couple of years, specifically looking at uh, what are some of the driving forces behind uh, the adoption adoption of technology in uh, agriculture, not just from an Alberta perspective, but also from a Canadian and, and perhaps also North American perspective. So you are here to present on the adoption of agriculture technologies in Canada, and obviously there must be some correlation to what's happening here in America. So what was the purpose of the study? What were you really trying to find from it? Well, I think there were two fundamental uh, forces. Uh, One was that I uh, myself, I was looking for data on adoption of technology in Canada. Uh, I really wanted to understand the uh, level of adoption myself and what does the landscape look like in Canada, both for myself, but then also for my students. My primary role is teaching. I'm teaching in a couple of different agriculture technology programs at Olds. And I guess I was curious to know, well, once these students have graduated, what, what do the job opportunities look like? To that end, it seems uh, as if the, the popular discourse in popular media and industry press focused on um, uh, sort of narrowed down almost two different segments or two different groups. So one group uh, would say they're not interested in technology. They want to farm with the traditional uh, ways and means. And then there's another group who is all in on technology. And for them, this is uh, yesterday's news and they don't see a reason why this should uh, uh, be of interest at all. So to that end, how do we place our students and what is the job market going to look like? How are the employers going to react when they go out in the job market? Uh, But then also from a public policy perspective, we see that technology is advancing. Major agricultural equipment manufacturers, such as John Deere in Case New Holland, is announcing that they intend to produce um, autonomous equipment and have that um, out by 2030 or so. As a matter of fact, we already have some of the manufacturers moving down that line today. So trying to understand what are the requirements to run this equipment and to be successful and what does it take to be a successful and sustainable farmer today? A lot of information going on in this study and a portion of it that I read was mentioned was the triple challenge. Could you touch on what that is? Yeah, so so the triple challenge is perhaps a little bit of a reconstitution of some of the articles and reports that I've read that's come out from the OECD, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, from the Food and Agriculture Organizations. They tend to focus on, on, on the three-pronged challenge that we face here in the agri-food system. Uh, one is around how do we feed a growing population. So we passed the 8 billion mark here last year, and uh, it looks, according to the United Nations uh, global population, 
Britain will peak at around 10, 10 and a half billion people uh, by the end of this uh, century. So how do we go about to feed a growing population? What is really important about that factor is that most of the population growth will occur in areas uh, that are not surrounded by abundance of agricultural land. So countries and regions such as Kansas and regions such as Alberta will become more and more important in helping to feed the world. So how do we meet that challenge? The second challenge is around environment, uh, particularly uh, climate change and, and biodiversity. Agriculture is, is uh, a big and important player in this sense. So, for example, at the global level, uh, the agriculture and food system generates roughly one quarter of global emissions. So how do we go about to mitigate and manage those emissions? Then a third challenge is coming from, I guess, what we call uh, technological innovations or technological progress. Uh, technology today is becoming more and more sophisticated. Our smartphones are packing more power and more computing power than uh, most of the, the, the early days computers that, uh, for example, used to, to drive rockets to the moon and so forth. We also see a rise of artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm not sure some of your listeners might have come across chat GPT. Uh, uh, I know Terry's nodding uh, his head, and I'm sure you too, Shelby, when you were in school, particularly last semester, everybody got hold of that AI engine and using that. So how do we prepare uh, our agriculture and food system in, in this context. The technology is moving ever so fast. There is a business a context where they say that technology tend to be exponential force. It's changing every day. But business models don't change that fast. So how do we reconcile these forces? Definitely three important challenges mm -hmm. that kind of go into this. And a portion of it and kind of what your topic seems to be talking about is adapting technology. Who is adapting technology and accepting it in? Who's not? So to that end, I, I started to search for some statistics that could help us an answer some of those questions. And, and uh, in my conversations with Terry, we've had some research on uh, looking at technology at adoption at a farm level. But what does this picture look at a regional scale? And, and uh, uh, Terry and his uh, co-authors released a paper by the U.S. Department of Agriculture here earlier this year on the adoption trends of uh, digital agriculture technologies in the U.S., so uh, I found that the agriculture census uh, that Statistics Canada have, Statistics Canada do a census once every five years, and the most recent census is from 2021. So uh, they asked farmers about their uh, technology usage and how they use technology and so forth on the farm, and that's probably what we're going to get into too in, in the rest of this conversation. Absolutely. And you mentioned Terry's study here. And so at the end, we'll kind of see if things correlate together from Canada and the United States. And I guess getting started, technology barriers, what is causing people to not bring technology into agriculture? Well, I believe that there's a multitude of factors that is happening there. But uh, specifically, what, what I guess what is common in both the USDA report, so I'm referring to that at, at um, that's the report that Terry and his co-authors wrote. And maybe in the show notes for today, you can provide a link to that study as well. And I'm happy to share my, uh, my study too. Uh, what we tend to find is that the adoption of agriculture technology is, is very much dependent on the farm type. So what type of operation do you have today? And also farm size. It tends to be the case that larger operations uh, are more uh, likely to adopt technological uh, innovations that helps them uh, farm uh, better. And so, Terry, he mentioned what the farm type is. And in your study, it showed that people that are using row crops and doing row crops are probably using auto steer. Mm -hmm. And so is that a correlation that you think will be seen in Canada? Yes. Um, one of the things about Canada that is sort of remarkable, they have the largest acreage per farm, of, I think, anywhere in the world on average. And technologies like automated guidance favor large fields that have you know, 20, 30 minutes of drive time from one end to another. And that's where, really where the benefit of automated guidance comes in. And so I, I would suspect that Western Ca Kansas would be somewhat similar to Alberta um, on that matter, you know, parts of the world where you measure your farm, your field sizes in sections instead of, you know, 40s and 50 acre fields. Other things with automated, like automated section control kind of favors fields that are not in rectangles or squares, but have odd-shaped ends, maybe has a creek across six or seven sides of the field. Th those types of smaller fields favor automated section control. 
So it kind of has something to do with the geography or, I guess, the geometry mm-hmm. of the agricultural fields in, in that region. And what was that interaction like when, from how it sounds, Thomas coming to you and saying, this is what I want to do, and you being able to help assist in making that possible for that country? <laughs> there's plenty of work to be done, and there's opportunities that pop up all the time. So things kind of fell into place right out a year ago. One of my colleagues in Australia contacted me and asked me to represent North America on a themed issue of a journal that they were working on. So what I did, I thought, well, United States, I can kind of do that. So I called Thomas and said, hey, can you do Canada? And then one of our MAB students in the department, uh, Arturo, is on faculty at a university in Mexico. So I said, hey, guys, can we get together and, and represent our countries and, and put together a paper that is represents North America for this um, larger project in Australia? And so – is really mutually beneficial. I think all the pieces fell into place and is very natural. That was Kansas State University cropping systems economist Terry Griffin, and he was joined by Olds College of Agriculture and Technology faculty member Thomas Nilsson. They were discussing why they were doing research on technology in agriculture. And we're going to continue that conversation with Terry and Thomas after the break, discussing what Thomas found in his research, specifically from his home of Canada, and how it relates back to Kansas. If you're about to reach your destination but don't want to miss out on the rest of this conversation. You can find it on agtoday.net, where you can also find Terry's past conversation about the research he did for the USDA. And that will be linked in today's show notes, which you can also find on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but when we come back, we'll be joined by Terry and Thomas once again on Agriculture Today. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we continue the conversation about adopting technology in agriculture. And with that conversation, we're once again joined by Olds College of Agriculture and Technology faculty member Thomas Nilsson and K-State Cropping Systems economist Terry Griffin. Thomas, to get us started, what did your study show? So when when we look at different type of technologies in Canada, we, we see that the level of, of technology adoption, as I said earlier, varies significantly. So what uh, we decided to do is to focus in on the most common type of farm, and that's oilseed and grain farms. So roughly a third of all farms in Canada are in the oilseed and grain farm segment. So 80% of all farms in oilseed and grain farms do use some sort of technology. And where it gets really interesting is that it seems like the the province out east in Ontario, uh, which is the most populous province in Canada, roughly 75% of all oilseed and grain farms use some technology. Now, as I said, the national average was 79%. So in the prairies, which includes uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, it's slightly higher. So then the question is, well, so the proportion portion of farmers that use technology is high. So what kind of technology do they use? Well, it seems as if uh, auto steer is very, very common. So so more than half of uh, all, all the seeds and grain farms uh, use auto steer for the reasons that Terry just highlighted and mentioned. Uh, next after that, soil sampling. Soil sampling is quite common, followed by uh, slow-release fertilizers. And then the two after that would be variable rate and then GAS mapping. Now, some of these technologies are contingent on one and each other. So if you imagine auto steer, where, which is the most commonly used technology, uh, it doesn't require a lot of auxiliary technology. And as a matter of fact, in the research that Terry talked about earlier, which also included a fourth co-author, Lavona Trevik with Arkansas State, auto steer really centers around what are the human capital requirements that are required. And it doesn't require a lot of training. It doesn't require a lot of extra additional input or activities. But when we talk about variable rate input, um, uh, for prescription for seed or for fertilizer, for chemicals. That requires that the producer also adopts GES mapping. They need to do soil mapping and yield mapping and so forth and be able to develop those prescriptions that are so needed. So the adoption rate of those technologies is somewhat lower. We anticipate that this may have something to do with the fact that there is a certain human capital requirements that is associated, particularly among the farmers that are of the smaller size compared to the national average. 
So is it accurate to say that a lot of things correlate back together? That if they adopt one technology, they're more likely to adopt another. Exactly so. Specifically for、uh, GIS mapping, variable rate prescriptions for soil sampling, and so forth. These are kind of technologies. If you call them in a way, they're they're sort of bundled, and 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 they need to have them there. But just because they are bundled, and and just because they are needed together, there are these barriers that we talked about earlier. So some of those three factors range around having access. Access to financial resources, connectivity. Of course, I think it's a pervasive issue in Kansas and the U.S. Midwest, but also in rural Canada too, as well. And also、uh, hiring workers. And I guess this is where it's not nice to see that we have a skills gap that is needed to help farmers to be successful. But as an educator, it also means that our job is even more important, much more important than than、uh, than I previously thought. Actually, and it's important that we develop programs that can train and educate world class professionals that can. Help solve some of these connectivity issues and challenges, and so forth. There is no more just average farmer in Canada. Yeah, that's right, and I, I think maybe that's not too much of an exaggeration to say that it's probably the same also in in the U.S. context. So the、uh, average farm size in in the United States is around 440 acres. In Canada, the average farm size is around 800 acres. But there is a great deal of variability. It varies widely depending on the type of production they're involved, the size、uh, that is there as well. And I think we have to be mindful about that as we go about to say educate me as an educator. Thinking about saying, well, we need sort of better filters, and we need to understand that、uh, different farm types and farm sizes have a very different need when it comes to the skills that are required, financial resources, and so forth. Farming, just like in the United States, in Canada, we're seeing the number of farms are declining. The average age of a farmer is continue to rise for both in the United States and in Canada as well. So we want to make the sector attractive. We want to incentivize young new farmers to come in and purchase. And they, by definition, they will be small if they enter at a young age. Well, they will be young producers taking over. So we need also to make sure that the technology fits them and fits their need, and also is not too expensive or complex for them to be able to get it in. So, talking in terms of North America, Terry and Thomas, putting your studies kind of together, what does it mean for North America producers? I do think, from an agricultural equipment perspective, here in Kansas, the producers have have access to John Deere and Agco, and that's the same also in Alberta. It's the same manufacturers. So, so, and they are taking a greater deal of interest in building equipment that is automated. They're looking into having different type of energy sources that powers the machine. These are machines ultimately that need some degree of connectivity. So, how do we overcome that? Data is another one of those big items too. Farmers are not only producing agricultural commodities; they're also generating data, they're consuming data, they're also selling some data. Some of the data they don't know that they own that they're passing on to other intermediaries. There's a lot of similarity. So Canada is a big country in so many ways. Eastern part, Ontario is where I had my first experiences and, and learned a lot from farmers in the London, Ontario area. And most recently, I've I spent time in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon、mm -hmm. right before the pandemic started. And there's a lot of variability in Canada,、mm -hmm. just like there is in the United States. So we we think of Kansas, a lot of weather variability、mm -hmm. in our state. From east to west in Kansas, and Canada is the same way. You know, eastern Canada is very different than Alberta, and Alberta、mm -hmm. is very different than Saskatchewan, which is very different、oh, yeah. than British Columbia, where you were telling me、yeah. you could hear the ocean、mm -hmm. waves <laughs> from your office.、Mm -hmm. You know, that's、uh, very, very different. You guys are both involved with extension. So, what does this mean for extension moving forward? So one of the things we were marking up on our、uh, dry erase、mm -hmm. board today. So if you look at my Twitter feed, I took a picture of, of Thomas in front of the dry erase board, and we had this little matrix drawn out, and it has something to do with the quality of life. Like automated guidance reduces stress, it increases quality of life, but the data side of ag tech. Generates data. It requires more human capital to make use of it than without the technology. Human capital is a good thing, but it's not costless. You have to learn. You have to devote energy, devote time to do that. And we made this grid, and we were asking ourselves, okay, if an individual person fits in this part of this matrix, they're a good candidate for using all the technologies. But if the person fits in a different corner of that grid, then maybe we should not encourage them to use. All the technologies, because they may need to spend that extra effort to doing some other things instead of 
trying to figure out what to do with drone imagery or trying to figure out what to do with yield monitor data or variable rate applications. So it's going to come down to the characteristics of the individual farmer about how we proceed. The analogy, well said, Terry, and I guess the analogy that comes to my mind when I think about that, it's farming today involves a lot of aspects around data. You're producing data, consuming data, as I said earlier, and manipulating data and so forth. And if a business owner is familiar with using the Google suite of products or Microsoft Excel and so forth, asking them to use a more complex software such as Tableau, for example, The learning curve is there for sure, but it's not that different. So going from Microsoft Excel to Tableau or using one of the Google products, it's not that big of a difference. But for someone that's never worked in manipulating spreadsheets and so forth and asking them to move straight into a very advanced data management program might be a little bit overwhelming. Likewise, coding, for example, if someone is familiar with a little bit of coding and exposed to some of the programs and so forth, for them to learn a new language like Python or R, for example, it's a learning curve for sure, but it's not that steep. And using some of these more advanced technology programs that we talked about in the program today and others, and I'm sure it's by no means extensive, farmers really need to think about all this trade-off that they have going on. And also we as researchers and as extension service providers, when we're providing this material, this may be a great thing, but in the grand scheme of thing of running a business, there's so many complex demands. Now, as I told many of, of the clients that I worked with at Olds College, you know, farming is a very demanding and complex business. So you can't imagine all the stressors they're facing and all the uncertainties that come with farming. Last year, we had Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and that tossed everything upside down. Fertilizers became more difficult. And then the grain market collapsed. And then we had bottleneck in the Suez Canal, which strangled commodity markets. It became hard to find spare parts for your machines and tractors. And all of those challenges are affecting farmers' daily life. And it's a lot harder for them to plan ahead and so forth. So Terry and I, from our perspective, we looked at digital agriculture technology. We, of course, think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But that may not necessarily reflect the reality of a producer today. They have many competing demands. So just being mindful of that, I think that's a a really important point. If you could tell Kansas producers who are thinking about possibly adopting technology, what would you tell them? I probably would pick up the phone and then I would talk to some producers that are using the technology. I would also not hesitate to reach out to the extension agents and, you know, maybe even get hold of Terry and his colleagues that are doing that and have them talk through it and and see what are the different use cases that exist. How can I use this to make my decisions more efficient and streamlined too? That was Old College of Agriculture and Technology faculty member Thomas Nilsson, and he was joined by Kansas State University cropping systems economist Terry Griffin as they discussed the adoption of technology in agriculture. The resources that they mentioned in today's show can be found in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. Weed control is often an endless task. However, hand pulling using pre- and post-emergent weed killer products and mulch are ways to control weeds. K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eyestone, discusses the effectiveness of these various control methods. Greg, we were just kind of talking about the fact that when we had all that rain, we quickly saw how fast some of the weeds were growing in the landscapes, the flower gardens, the vegetable gardens, and we really want to get on top of that. We do. Uh, They are competitive and going to take some of the moisture away in drought situations. You know, it's important that uh, our desirable plants get all the moisture that's available, and they're going to take up space maybe do some shading of our plants. So it is good to manage weeds. It's an ongoing thing. It's not going to be a one-time fix, but throughout the season, we need to be thinking about how to control these problem plants. If it's something that is on the minor side, we might be able to get away with just some hand pulling. Yeah, that still definitely works in situations where it's not too vast of an area and uh, very effective and you see immediate results. And so this can be done. I might encourage you to water or do it right after a a rain event so that they are a little bit easier to pull out. But uh, that is still a viable solution. So if you have a big problem, you're probably thinking that you need to do a pre-emergent at some point. You can. So we want to start uh, with a clean slate, if you will, because pre-emergents only affect the seedling 
cleans uh, the young plants as they start to produce their root system. And so you start with a clean slate, whether you did some hand pulling or maybe even some cultivation with a hoe, something like that. Hoe works for larger areas. We want to probably use what's called a scuffle hoe. It's a little different than your typical looking tool that you find at a hardware store. Scuffle hoe has a flat blade, and so that's going to cut those roots and uh, the growing points off. And so you're not stirring up the soil as much, creating more weeds as you stir up the soil. So when you have a clean slate, we can put down a pre-emergent to control at least some of the weeds. Preen is probably the most common product out there. It's trifluralin is the active ingredient. can be found in other products, but that's one most typically found and labeled for a lot of flowers, vegetables, and in the landscape as well. Read and follow all label directions on products like that uh, is going to get you the best uh, use of that product. And they do, uh, you know, peter out, so to speak. And so find out when you may need to reapply that. So what about post-emergence then? When do we use those? So if you have some weeds that are coming up that uh, you can't control, whether it's cultivation or hand pulling, there are products that can be used to control weeds. Again, you're going to have to read and follow label directions. Glyphosate is probably the most common, controls a lot of weeds, and it affects anything it comes in contact with, and so you need to be careful. Application or application equipment comes into play here. Uh, If you just can swipe product onto the, the weed itself, then you control just that weed and not maybe the surrounding plants that you're trying to uh, protect. And so just maybe the application comes into play a little bit more than the product that you select. But again, you do need to have a product that's labeled for that use. Glyphosate can be used in some of the vegetable areas and, of course, flowers and landscapes. And there are other products that are out there as well that can be used. Just read the product label. And I guess one of the best ways to really suppress the weed growth is just through using mulch. That is a great way to help slow down weed competition. Uh, Many of our weed seeds need sunlight, and that's when we stir it up with a hoe improperly. They come to light and they start to germinate. So if we can shade them, whether it be with growing plants well, so they shade out the competition or areas that uh, are bare ground, if you will, putting down a, we prefer as horticulturists, wood chip mulch, something organic that's going to break down and improve the soil as well as slow down weed growth. And we're still looking at about three to four inches? Yeah, it depends on your soil texture, really, for good plant growth. So if you have a heavy clay soil, which a lot of people claim to have, a little thinner layer would be good for gas exchange for root growth of your desirable plants. But uh, if you have a sandy soil, yeah, three to four inches, uh, it's not going to inhibit that airflow and uh, we'll do a really good job at suppressing weed growth. And we will see this throughout the summer, like you say. This is something we'll probably have to revisit. It is. The products wear out, uh, people wear out, but the weeds keep going. And so, yeah, it's, it's a season-long uh, management that you have to do. And so if you do some of these approaches, then hopefully it will reduce some of that competition. That's K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eystone, with advice on controlling weeds. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.